keep you within that set of six states, which are the eigenstates of Zx and y spin. Uh, so it turns out that you, know, you can take about 180 degree rotations, they do that, certain 120 degree rotations, about an axis that sort of sticks out in the middle of the octant. That'll do it. So there's 24 of those and all, and they all correspond to rotations on the block sphere. In the toy theory that I showed you, starting from the classical bit, you also have 24 uh, transformations. They're just the 24 permutations of the ontic states. Uh, but when you look at them in that block sphere-like picture, you find that uh, some subset of them uh, also involve reflections. So you've got still an isomorphism. It's just that whereas in the quantum case, it's always rotations. In the classical case, it's some rotations and some combinations of rotations and reflections. Um, <clears throat> so you're sort of the, 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 the classical, <clears throat> excuse me, epistemically restricted theory is lacking some of the rotations that we see in quantum mechanics uh, and replacing them with combinations of rotations and reflections. Uh, so you still have a one-to-one -one mapping, but uh, it's, it's not quite the same set of transformations. Um, okay, well, let's, let's get started for today. So um, today we're, we're going to talk about uh, Bell's theorem. And um, you, I know you've seen this before in Jarmerson's course. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do today is uh, make Bell's theorem as intuitive as possible. Uh, and I want you to really understand it kind of, you know, in your bones in a way that you can, you know, go to the bar and explain it to a lay person, you know, over a beer. Uh, so that's my objective. I want to make it uh, as, seem as trivial as possible to you. Because mathematically, it is not uh, a technically difficult result. But conceptually, it's very significant. And so I think it's important to really understand it deeply. Uh, so that's the objective for today. Um, so let me, let me review some of what we did last time. I, I should say that Bell's theorem is important regardless of what your interpretational persuasion is. Uh, so it's not a result that you know, hurts one particular camp but not others. Everybody has to contend with, with this result. So for example, whether you let's suppose you want hidden variables, whether you go for a psi-ontic or a psi-epistemic hidden variable it uh, doesn't matter. Bell's theorem says you're going to have a problem with locality regardless. Um, but uh, you know, as we saw last time, the uh, EPR effect, uh, where Einstein said, look, we ha if we were committed to the notion that quantum states represent reality, then we would have a funny kind of non-locality. Uh, what that proves is that there are certain kinds of phenomena uh, where psionic models might require non-locality and psi-epistemic model do not require non-locality. So that explanation I gave you of EPR, everything was local, because all that was happening was that the person here was updating their knowledge about the distance system. So if, if you've just seen that, uh, imagine you're Einstein, 1935. From your perspective, you might say, well, uh, you know, so far we don't have any good reasons for giving up on locality. Uh, you know, maybe all we really have to do is make sure that we interpret the quantum state epistemically, and everything can stay local. But uh, in 1964, Bell showed that even if you interpret the quantum state epistemically, you still can't have locality. You still have problems. Uh, so in a sense, I think Einstein would have been surprised by that result because uh, I think he expected to be able to do some, you know, have an interpretation of quantum theory that was local. Um, anyhow, so, so let's, let's, let me try to introduce Bell's theorems from the perspective of these models we just saw uh, yesterday. So uh, I'll remind you that the idea there was that we start with the classical statistical theory, we add some restriction on the form of those statistical distributions, and we show that we can derive the operational predictions of some large subset of quantum theory. Uh, and in particular, uh, what we really derived was uh, for that large part of quantum theory, so Gaussian quantum mechanics for the continuous variable case, and something called stabilizer theory for the qubit case, or at least something close to it, uh, well, what we obtained was actually a psi epistemic hidden variable model, because in those uh, uh, models, two non-orthogonal quantum states uh, describe two overlapping distributions. Uh, so for example, in the, the discrete model, if you looked at the z-spin eigenstates and the x-spin eigenstates, uh, they had some elements in common on the ontic state space. Uh, so they, they were overlapping distributions, uh, so they were psi epistemic. And now, it, by the light of those models, you can start to categorize different quantum phenomena. Uh, so over here on the left are quantum phenomena that arise in one of these restricted statistical theories. And by, the, by that, I mean 
if you think about what it is about those phenomena that make them surprising from a classical perspective. So there's often sort of a standard story about, you know, why is this surprising? Um, you know, so the EPR effect, you might say, well, it's surprising because it looks as if there has to be some non-local action. Or with teleportation, the surprise was the amount of information you communicate seems to be inadequate to, uh, you know, is not enough to describe the quantum state. And so if, if the point is that these uh, sorts of models allow you to explain these kinds of phenomena, at least explain their surprising features. Uh, so to my mind, they, they reduce the mystery of these sorts of things. And we saw a number of these examples, like ambiguity of mixtures, the EPR effect, uh, collapse, teleportation, stuff like that. Of course, these sorts of phenomena don't arise classically because the models we were looking at involve some innovation relative to a classical theory. Namely, there's a restriction on how much you can know. So you could say these are all non-classical phenomena, and I'll call this you know, type 1 non-classicality. If you introduce this fundamental uh, restriction, it's a kind of uncertainty principle, agents can never know uh, everything, well, then you get a number of non-classical phenomena that appear on this list. Uh, but it turns out that you can't get all the mysterious quantum phenomena that way. There are quantum phenomena that uh, even qualitatively aren't reproduced by these sorts of models. And uh, the most prominent examples are Bell inequality violations. That's what we're going to talk about today. Something called contextuality, which we're going to see later in the week. Quantum computational speed up. Uh, so what was proven in, in the mid-90s is that there's certain difficult mathematical problems, in particular factoring, uh, which can be done uh, efficiently on a quantum computer. And thus far, nobody's ever come up with an efficient classical algorithm for those sorts of problems. Uh, and people suspect that there is no efficient classical solution. So we haven't proven that there's a gap, uh, but uh, we, every, most computer scientists suspect that uh, quantum computers really are more powerful. Uh, and if so, uh, these sorts of models cannot explain that additional computational power. And then there are other things, you know, I can extend both of these lists. Um, and what's interesting about these kinds, you can think of this as type 2 non-classicality. It's, you know, not enough to assume that there's a restriction on what you know to get these guys. Uh, what's particularly interesting about them is if, if you find this approach to hidden variable models where the quantum states of the state of knowledge appealing, this is really the challenge, you know, this is the obstacle to moving forward. Yes? Um, sorry, part of the definition of a classical, classical theory? theory? Like, a, you mean like a classical hidden variable model? Well, just in the sense that you use, for example, Tippett's definition of classical theory. Oh, I see. Um, so precisely not the obstacle. Well, what I was saying about, you're, you're talking about uh, computational capabilities? No, just, well, uh, just in general, how you define the notion of classical theory? So, so I guess what, what I meant strictly was that uh, when we talked last Friday, I guess it was, about a classical theory whose uh, operational state space is a simplex. So there it's, it's basically you're saying, look, there's, there's you know, some space of physical states, and I can assign any probability distribution over them, and I can do any measurement that distinguishes them. That defines what I'll call a classical operational theory. So it's you know, all of classical probability theory. There's no restriction on what you know. If you, if you add one of these fundamental axioms that says, oh, agents can't know everything, then your convex set of operational states changes. So for example, in that discrete theory from last time, it was like uh, an octahedron. You know, it's that thing that I embedded in the tetrahedron. So that's no longer a simplex. An octahedron also has multiple decompositions of a, a given state into multiple states. So I would call that a non-classical theory. And, and what I'm saying is that it, it has a certain kind of uh, set of non-classical phenomena, things that we're familiar with from quantum theory. Uh, but there are other quantum phenomena that that sort of model won't capture. So it hasn't gone far enough. Yes? So in particular, what you're talking about is uh, restricted statistical classical theory. Are you talking about, for example, uh, taking states whose Wigner functions are, are positive? Does that count? And so by extension, stabilizers? Um, that's or not does quite. That not really fit under? Okay. Well, uh, to some extent, yes. So for the continuous variable case, if I said, let's, let's take all those states and measurements who, who have positive Wigner representation, 
then that theory is actually equivalent to the restricted classical theory I showed you. Yeah. And um, I mean, you know, the only nuance is that uh, you know, you, just having discovered the Wigner representation, it might not be obvious that actually we could derive all of these uh, functions by starting from classical theory and adding this one simple uh, axiom about you know you can only know so much, and then those functions are just all the functions that uh, have that kind of knowledge. But yeah, basically you know for for sub theories of quantum mechanics that admit all positive Wigner representations, that's going to be one of these classical restricted classical theories. But there are other representations of quantum states um, that are not the Wigner representation, and it could be that for you know you give me some set of experiments, if I can find a representation. Uh, over any state space, right? So now instead of phase space, it might be some other manifold. Suppose I introduce a, a representation of those quantum states and measurements that's everywhere positive. I will have now found a statistical, you know, a, a hidden variable model for that experiment. Uh, so, so it might not be the Wigner function that, that gives you the model. Other questions? Okay, so. In some sense, uh, you know, from the psi epistemic perspective, these are the where the real quantum weirdness lies. Uh, so that's so today we'll we'll uh, look at Bell's theorem. So here's gonna here's the setup. Um, we're gonna imagine that there are two um, measurements uh, that one can do. I'm just gonna label them arbitrarily s and t, uh, and they're each two outcome measurements. So you know this the, the green LED light and the red LED light coming on just corresponds to the two outcomes of that measurement. And similarly with T. And, and the setup now is going to be that uh, you're going to imagine an operation that prepares a pair of systems. And then you know, one system is taken off to the left. The other system is taken off to the right. Imagine these are distant locations. Uh, and then one of those two measurements, S or T, is done on each side. So there's four possibilities for the measurements. It's either you know, S on both sides, or S on the left, T on the right, or T on the left, S on the right or T on both. And which measurement is done on a given side is, is determined at random. Okay? Uh, and it's not determined ahead of time. So you know, when the particles are prepared here, uh, they don't know what measurement they're going to encounter uh, at the wings of the experiment. Um, and, and the question is, you know, what sorts of correlations uh, can we generate? So in order to make this. Uh, as intuitive as possible, uh, the way I like to do this is that we're going to have, um, uh, we're going to sort of act it out, and I'm going to need volunteers from the audience. And to <laughs> entice people to volunteer, uh, you have a promise of a cash prize if you manage to solve the puzzle that I'm going to set for you. So I need two volunteers, uh, and I'm going to need two helpers as well. So Sarah's going to be one of my helpers. And anybody who's like really seen this stuff before, uh, maybe should be my other helper. Um, actually, maybe Katya, if you could be my other helper, okay. that would be great. All right, so I need two volunteers. Yes, and yes. Perfect. Come on down. And actually, I need my two helpers as well. Come on down to the front. Okay, so uh, I have some equipment for my helpers. There you go. And this. Yes, high tech. Well, this is high tech. Uh, you guys can stay in the middle. Um, and catch if I can get you to stand on the other end of the room. OK, great. So, so the idea is this. Sarah and Katya are emulating the measurement devices. Uh, so they each have a, a coin they're going to flip, which is going to decide uh, uh, what measurement is going to be done. And you guys are emulating the particles. OK? Uh, so, so at the beginning, you're, you're going to be able to confer, just like the particles are sort of uh, locally interacting here. Uh, and then you're going to go off to the separate stations. Uh, and it's going to be like, you know, imagine that we have like soundproof boxes. So you can't communicate at that stage. So you're each going to learn what your local choice of measurement is. Uh, but the other person is not going to know. Okay? And we are going to be you know, watching you to make sure that you know, you're not signaling to one another. Uh, and, and and that's basically it. So what's going to happen is that uh, Ketch and Sarah are each going to flip a coin. And then they have a piece of paper. They're going to write down either S or T. And you're going to, as a particle, you're going to provide the response. You're going to write down you know, red or green as you know, the, the outcome that the, the measurement device is going to generate. Okay, so that's, that's all you're going to do at the end is write down red or green. 
depending on what SRT is. And your objective as a pair, as a team, is going to be to satisfy the correlations that I'm about to describe. So the next slide is going to sort of set the rules of the game. Here are the correlations that you're trying to generate. So there's going to be certain sort of winning conditions. And if at the end, when we bring the two cards together, your answers satisfy the winning conditions, then you get the coins. Um, is, that, is that clear? Okay. Yep. So, so yep. can both the end from SMT be read? Or has to be like yeah, it, you can have any choice of algorithm you want to, to, for how to deliver your response to, to the measurement. Um, yeah, so is everybody else sort of clear on, on how the game works? Yes, clear. OK, so you guys are going to uh, wait to flip the coin, if I tell you so. So now I'm going to present you with your challenge. And so meanwhile, the rest of you should also be thinking about how, what, what kind of strategy could possibly uh, you know, win, win the game. Uh, so here, here it is. So you know, the stuff on the top that I already told you, there are two possible measurements, S and T. They each have two outcomes. Um, and they're going to each occur at random. And so the idea is that if it happens that the same measurement is made on the two sides, so if they've both written down S or both written down T, uh, then the outcomes should agree for you to win. Okay? So you have to respond both red or green in that case. But if the measurements are different on the two sides, then the outcomes you report should disagree. So when those two cards come together, as long as uh, your responses satisfy these conditions, you'll win. OK, so I want you guys to confer on a strategy that you can use to try to win this game. And the rest of you take, say, a few minutes to, to just figure this out. And you can talk amongst yourselves about strategy if you want. Um, so just take a few minutes to think it through. Are you guys ready? You ready? Okay. Um, all right, so, so now I want you guys to go off to your separate booths, and we're going to watch you. And now we're going to have the coin flip simultaneously, and then the whole thing. Is, uh, okay, go. <laughs> so write down the S or T on the paper, depending on the outcome, and then pass on the. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. This is so suspenseful. Uh, OK, so the results are in. On the left, we had T, and the answer was green. On the right, we had S, and, and the answer was red. So you win. So you can let's give them a round of applause. Collect your prizes. Well done. <laughs> uh, and you can all sit down now. Um, but there's still more cash to be won. Don't worry. Uh, thank you, Katja. Uh, OK, so wait, actually, maybe you can tell us what your strategy was. I would make those variable 
It was what? All right, let's hear the strategy. Yeah, well, it was very simple. Um, S was always red and green was always T. Good, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this, these, are, these are the correlations you were trying to generate. This is just a graphical representation of the kind of strategy you said. So, so if you both get, you know, that the bottom and the top are sort of the different possible alternatives on each side. If you both get T, you both get S, then your outcomes have to agree. But if you get the other two possibilities, they have to disagree. So if, for example, you chose green for S and red for T, just the opposite of what you chose, well, then you see that easily all these correlations work out exactly, and you will always win the game, regardless of which of the four challenges you're given. OK, so uh, here's the next challenge. And now any of you can win a dollar by uh, suggesting a strategy that wins this one. Uh, so it's exactly the same setup as before. But now, if the same measurement is made on A and B, then the outcomes should disagree. <laughs> and if different measurements are made on A and B, the outcomes should agree. So again, take a minute to think it over. And then I'll uh, ask someone who hasn't already won a dollar whether they, they have a proposed solution. So, anyone want to win a dollar? Go ahead. Um, so the two people decide always say opposite answers. So when one sees T, they always say green. And when one sees B, they always say red. So if they just both decide to say Ruben, say this time, when he gets T, he always says red. When he gets S, he always says green. And very much the opposite approach. So right. Like, right. Yes. Exactly. Where's your dollar? <laughs> um, there we go. So I heard that there was quarters given out earlier this morning, uh, which surprises me because I don't know of anyone else who does this. But, uh, I'm happy that I always give out dollars, so I'm not trying to one-up anyone here. <laughs> the way it works. Uh, no, honestly, you can ask Sarah. I gave out dollars last year or the year before. Uh, and with inflation, really, it's, you know, soon it will be more. Uh, yeah, so, so this is the, uh, the new challenge now, is that the outcome should disagree on these cases, agree in the other two cases. And so if there's you know, green for S and red for T over here, and then as long as the other person is doing the opposite, the red for S and green for T, then looking at each one of these, you'll see that you have exactly the right pattern. OK, so uh, final challenge now. So now you get the idea of how you know, we can generate different kinds of correlations by these sorts of local uh, coordinated strategies. Here's uh, your third challenge. Um, and uh, this one's worth $2. The inflation's happening as we speak. Uh, no, this is a really good one. So, so tell me how you'll uh, uh, win this game. So whenever the measurement t is made on both sides, then the outcome should disagree. Okay, But otherwise, so if the measurements are s and s, or s and t, or t and s, then your outcomes should always agree. So again, uh, maybe talk amongst yourselves for, for a couple of minutes. Think it through. Uh, and uh, tell me uh, a strategy for winning this game. Do we have to win all the time, or do we have to win a majority of the time? Um, you have to win as much as you possibly can win. <laughs> <laughs> That's your objective. <laughs> Ideally, you should win all the time. That would be nice. Because if we were like acting it out, then you would only get the money for sure <laughs> if, you, if you satisfy those conditions. I think, I don't know if this is too trivial or not, right? So one person will always say one color. So one person always answers, say, red, no matter what they're asked, yeah? And the other one will say green when it's T and red when it's S. OK, so, so you're saying, uh, let's answer red for S 
and red for T, say on the left. And then on the right, so <coughs> red for S and green for T? Yeah. OK. So uh, if oh, no, T no. and T, yeah, so if T and T are asked, they disagree, which is good. So let me write a dashed line for disagreement. But yeah, you've already seen the problem is that you know, you've got agreement here and here, but now you've got disagreement here when you should have had agreement. So you're only going to win three quarters of time with this strategy. Any other comers? Yes. Uh, well, actually, you've already won a dollar. So let me, let me, let me open it up. Yes, Nicole. Well, there's another three quarter strategy. OK, what's that? Everyone answers red all the time. OK. If everyone answers red, uh, I'll do it over here. Then you just get agreement everywhere, and uh, you know you, you don't get the disagreement down here where you're supposed to. Um, so yeah, that also gives you the three-quarter strategy. So you you know too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I can I can uh, I can. I'll, Sorry, I'll have to exempt you from this contest. Um, there'll be other opportunities. <laughs> uh, let, let me open it up to the rest of you who maybe haven't seen this before. Um, does anyone want to suggest a solution? And you, and you, you can't take more money from me, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I need somebody who hasn't already Already done so today. No one? Oh yeah, the yeah, I think you can't you can't do better than seventy five percent of the time. Okay, why? Because well, if, if you're if for any outcome that uh, one of the one of them chooses, yep. say, say like in that strategy, then okay. So here, talk talk me through it. Here are your two outcomes. So say you answer red here. Yeah, then that deterministically fixes the value of P and S on the other side. Okay, so they have to be what? Oh, they have to be red. Right, because they they both have to be agreement. Yeah. Okay. And then T on the on at the third side has to be red because it has to agree with the other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this this necessarily means that that the outcomes on the bottom have to agree. Right. Exactly. And had you started with green here, you would have gotten exactly the same thing. So that's a proof that you can't you can't win this game hundred percent of the time. And so you win the money? It was a trick question, but 75 cents? Sorry? Is it 75 cents? <laughs> so you want 75 cents out of this? 75 cents. quarters of the time, though. Right, right, yeah. Well, you know, I, I thought it would it'd be unfair um, to like, actually, you know, give you a chance of losing. So I've set it up so you could you know, just win by being clever. Um, good. So, so yeah, that's... That's exactly right. That I've now uh, described for you a game which you can't win 100% of the time by these coordinated local strategies. So this was the rules of the game, uh, and it's, you know this is the argument we just went through. That you know whatever you start with here, you can sort of have a pattern that tells you, okay, this one's going to have to be green as well. But then they don't disagree, so you don't, so you don't win. Um, and uh, but, you know, as we've been talking about before, you know, there's lots of uh, strategies that get probability three quarter, and, and that's the best you can do because um, you can't get all four right. So uh, we know that the game can be won uh, at most 75% of the time by these local strategies. So the, the surprising thing is that if you prepare the pair of particles in an entangled quantum state and you do certain quantum measurements, what you find is that those particles can win this game. 85% of the time. So imagine we repeated the game over and over again, you know, always the same rules. Measurements are chosen in random. They have to satisfy these kinds of correlations I described up here. Uh, you find that, uh, you know, despite the fact that you're shooting at the random, the particles win 
about 85% of the time. It's actually one half plus one over two root two. Um, and that's very bizarre because if those particles, uh, you know, were had kind of local instruction sets that they were carrying with them to the measurement devices to inform how they should act, uh, you'd think that they could only win at most 75% of the time. So uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, suppose, suppose you know, we had done that experiment earlier, uh, and, and, and we did it with the rules of game three. And, uh, and our contestants just, you know, we did it over and over again, and they were winning 85% of the time, more than 75% of the time. Then you'd think something's going on. They're obviously cheating in some way. Because there's just no way they could win more than 75% of the time. So how could they cheat? That's the question. What are the, 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 the ways of cheating in that kind of game that would allow you to win more than 75% of the time? Uh, well, there's the yeah. Find a way to communicate, not the point play. Right. So, so if uh, uh, Miriam could communicate the setting that she just learned on her outcome, to Ruben, then he could use that extra information to decide you know, how he should, should answer. That's why we were watching you to make sure that didn't happen. Yes? I could also bribe them in advance. Yes, you could do that. You could try to rig the game by ensuring that those outcomes are not actually random. So I just have to make sure settings. I win more prize money than I pay to bribe them. And right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You use a quarter you won in the first lecture. <laughs> uh, right, so, um, so yeah, if, if, let, let's start talk about that first possibility. Um, you know, if you communicate the choice of the measurement in one wing to the system in the opposite wing. So explicitly, uh, in this game, for instance, uh, let's see. So if, if for example, um, the, the, the particle over here uh, learns that the distant measurement is S, then uh, they will answer uh, green for T. But if they learn that the distance measurement is T, then they will answer red, uh, and that way they, they get the right correlations. Uh, good. So there's a problem with this kind of scheme, which is if we wanted to, if, if we had a slightly more high-tech version of this experiment we just ran, uh, wherein the measurement, that, wherein these two wings are very far apart, and the measurement is chosen uh, and the outcome is registered you know, very quickly afterwards in such a way that even if uh, a message is sent at the speed of light uh, at the time when the measurement is chosen off to the other wing, uh, it doesn't arrive there in time uh, to inform this particle of what kind of outcome it's going to give. And similarly here. So instead of you know, putting the contestants in soundproof booths, you're basically making sure that relativity guarantees no cheating. Uh, because there's just no time to communicate the outcome of the measurement. Uh, and if you do an experiment uh, where you try to set it up in this way uh, and distinguish the quantum predictions from the predictions of uh, any one of these local models, uh, you find that quantum theory generates uh, the correct predictions, not the local model. So you do get this 85% rather than 75%. Uh, so that's kind of surprising. It's, it, it seems to be a kind of tension between the predictions of quantum theory and the predictions of relativity theory. Because if you, uh, for example, one way out would be to insist that there really is a communication going on. It's just faster than the speed of light. Uh, and that means that there's some sort of causal influence, which seems, I mean, it, it might not strictly be in contradiction with relativity if you can't use it to send signals. But it seems to be in tension with relativity. Relativity seems to tell us we shouldn't have anything propagating superluminally. Um, so that's, that's the, the basic idea of Bell's theorem. Uh, so let's just go through a few of the, the kind of more nuanced aspects. So if, if uh, the particles have access to randomness when deciding on their strategy, can it help them to generate uh, the correlations of that, that third game? I'll, I'll call those the uh, uh, Bell correlations. Um, well, it would just be as if you guys had you know, used a coin to decide on which of several strategies you're going to take. Like maybe you could have you know, chosen this strategy with one probability, this strategy with another probability. But none of those strategies wins the game 100% of the time. So any mixture of those strategies isn't going to win the game 100% of the time either. So having randomness uh, in, in the properties of the particles uh, isn't going to help you do better. Um, now what if, what if the particles used local randomness? So 
the particles wait till they get to the wings, and only then do they use randomness to deliver their outcome. Will that help? I don't think so, because you'd just end up with one of these schemes. It would have just been kind of decided at the end of, you know, when they went together. Yeah, it makes no difference whether they flip their coins when they get to the ends of the classroom or whether they flip their coins earlier. Uh, it's the same, you know, probability distribution. And we already established that if they flip their coins early, you know, it's not going to help them. Uh, so yeah, this, this is not going to help uh, generate those bell correlations. Um, the degree of correlation that they generate with this kind of random scheme can only be uh, the, you know, 75% or less than 75%. They could do worse. By, like, if, if they really make their strategies totally independent of one another, they won't even win 75% of the time. Um, and so, so the consequence of this is that the uh, Bell's argument hasn't relied on uh, an assumption of deterministic hidden variables. It's, it's not important to imagine that the you know, particles fix the outcomes of those measurement devices deterministically. Even if we imagine that there's objective indeterminism in the universe, and the responses of those devices uh, are not fixed by any fact about the past, uh, nonetheless, uh, we still cannot explain the Bell correlation using a local scheme. Uh, because this whole business of you know, using randomness uh, is just a way of describing that possibility of having uh, indeterminism in your model. Uh, so early on, uh, there were many papers written on how you know maybe we get we we preserve we salvage locality by abandoning determinism, but you can't that doesn't work. <clears throat> okay, um, now what about this? If suppose that the detector inefficiencies, so so real detectors don't always respond. So you know you send a particle into them. Sometimes they just don't give you an outcome at all. Um, so so the inefficiency of a detector is sort of the probability that it doesn't give you an outcome. Um, if they're sufficiently high, then can it be that particles which uh, obey local causality, so they're using this local instruction set, uh, can they simulate uh, the correlation, uh, the correlations that we're looking for, these Bell correlations, on the pairs of particles that actually are detected? So when I you know, collate all the data, we run the experiment many times, and I ask, okay, is it the case that the winning condition was always satisfied? Suppose I only look at the cases where outcomes were registered. You know, when no outcome was registered, I say, well, now I'm not going to check the winning condition there. Uh, is it possible that these uh, particles, even though they're actually using one of these local instruction sets, could nonetheless simulate these uh, funny correlations if those detector inefficiencies are high enough? Yes? I think we should assume that whether the detector works or not is also a sort of local random variable. So when you delete all the data in which one of the detectors didn't respond, you'll end up with a random subset of the data you had before, which still satisfies no more than 75% correlations. Good. So, so it's certainly true that you know, if, if we make that assumption, so imagine that the uh, inefficiency of the detectors are randomly distributed relative to the particle strategies, then certainly you're absolutely right. Um, but do we have to make that assumption? Is, is there some, what if we don't make that assumption? What if the particles are the ones who get to decide when the detector doesn't work? So yeah. you'd make a scheme where, so to fix that game last time, you'd yeah. have on the right go green on T and don't respond on X, and then on the other side go red on T. Yeah. And then yeah, let's go back to that. Um, so you know here. You could have it, let's say you know, they agree ahead of time, OK, we're, we're going to answer green to all of them. And uh, if, if the guy on the left happens to be asked T, then just deliver no outcome. And that way, uh, uh, you know, we'll win in the cases where we do deliver outcomes. We make the detectors fire. But in the one case where we uh, uh, would have, uh, well, sorry, if it's, if it's uh, yeah, in the one case where we had the potential of losing, uh, we're not going to deliver an outcome. And then we protect ourselves from you know, uh, losing the game. 
And so if the particles are the ones who get to decide on uh, when the detectors fire and when they don't, then they can simulate these Bell correlations just by being clever in this way. Uh, that fact is called the detector loophole. Um, so in practical experiments, if your efficiency, so you, know, you can calculate what is the efficiency uh, threshold such that you can always you know, win the game. And, and so they, they need to uh, make the detectors have very high efficiency to really ensure that the particles aren't using this strategy. Uh, and so it's called the loophole because it just means that, you know, uh, practically speaking, in experiments, it's difficult to uh, ensure that, you know, the, there isn't this possibility of salvaging locality. You know, so we need to get those detector efficiencies high enough. And in certain experiments um, involving uh, trapped ions, they've managed to um, close the detector loophole, which means that they've done the measurements with sufficiently high efficiency uh, that you know, the particles couldn't um, uh, leverage that inefficiency to simulate the Bell correlations. Yes? But if you actually implemented this simple game, yeah. wouldn't it be pretty obvious if there was never an outcome on the CT? Well, OK, good point. Um, the, if, as long as the particles you know, are clever, they, they can use different strategies. So they can say, well, sometimes we're going to you know, go all red. Sometimes we're going to go all green. Sometimes we're going to use you know, this guy, red, 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 green. And in each one of those different scenarios, well, there's a different condition under which we cause the detector to fail. And if they do it that way, then there's no pattern in the failures. You know, the failures are equally likely to occur for any of these combinations. Uh, OK, so what about um, if the choice of measurement is made too early? Um, so I remember I said back over here on the slide about relativity that uh, you know, imagine that the, this time interval is short so that uh, even uh, light can't get over here. But you know, what if we decide on which measurement is going to be made you know, earlier, ahead of time? You know, then, then can the particles win the game? Yep. Yeah, if, if I make this measurement too early, bring it all the way down here, then a subluminal signal does have time to inform this particle over here how it should register. Uh, and so this, this is called the locality loophole. So you need to, uh, let, let's say in practice, in your experiment, you, know, you can only make your random setting choices so quickly. You can only register your outcome so quickly. That's going to set uh, you know, a lower bound on how far apart away the two wings of the experiment have to be to really enforce this relativistic constraint on, on the cheating strategy. And so um, the Bell experiments that actually get the wings far enough apart that they can you know, ensure this are the ones that use photons. And the problem is that uh, unlike trapped ions, the detector efficiencies for photons are much less. Um, and so it is possible to close the locality loophole for photons, to actually do the experiments fast enough that the, you know, the, uh, the, the photon on the left wing couldn't have known about the setting on the right wing. Uh, but thus far, nobody has done an experiment that closes both the detector loophole and the locality loophole at the same time. Uh, but we're probably going to see somebody do this experiment maybe this year, maybe next year. So you'll, you'll be hearing about it in the news sometime soon, I'm guessing, uh, because people have gotten very close now to, to being able to achieve high enough efficiencies with photons to close the detector loophole as well. Um, good. <clears throat> so, so if you want a, a kind of a, a realist or causal explanation of these sorts of experiments, then uh, the real mystery, I think, is that there's a certain kind of tension. Uh, on the one hand, uh, quantum theory does not allow you to send superluminal signals. And I'll explain uh, why in a moment. But uh, to some extent, it's, it's even a constraint on um, our, uh, our Hamiltonians. Like Typically, we say, well, we're only going to load those Hamiltonians which you know, have causal influences that propagate within the light cone. And, and, so, and furthermore, there's no real way of using these sort of funny steering effects where I do a measurement here and change the statistics over there. You can show that none of those effects can be used to send signals faster than the speed of light. Um, so in that sense, you have consistency with relativity theory. But if you think that you need to have some sort of causal explanation of these correlations, then given what we just saw, 
it would appear that the only way to do it is if somehow the choice of setting on one end informs the choice of outcome on the other end. And that has to be done by sending information faster than the speed of light. So it's not information we can access at the operational level. You know, we as agents doing the experiment can't learn what the settings were on the other side uh, early. But the particles who deliver their outcomes and have to generate these correlations, they seem to, to need to know. And so it seems like we would have to imagine that there are some superluminal influences. Um, and that isn't an outright contradiction, but it does seem uh, to be a certain kind of tension existing in the theory. Yes? Where exactly is the boundary between having superluminal influences and having signaling? Is it a clear distinction? Uh, when you have what? Yeah, so, so what I need to have superluminal signals is that over here, this, say I do a particular measurement and I look at the statistics of that measurement. It has to be that the statistics I see depend on the setting of the distant apparatus. And in the experiment I just showed you, uh, the way the, the quantum statistics work is that you know, the probability of getting any given outcome here is always uh, a half uh, for the maximally entangled state. And so the probabilities are independent of what, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done over there, S or T, the probabilities here will be a half. It's only when you get those outcomes together and you say, well, you know, were they the same or were they different? That's where you see um, you know, these very strong correlations. But there's, there's really no way to use it to, to send a message. Yes? So basically, the issue is that if you have a superluminal signaling mm -hmm. um, versus superluminal influence, it kind of boils down to if you have a superluminal influence, you generate a correlation. But you can only see that by bringing the two systems together. And you cannot bring the two systems together faster than the speed of light. Right. Essentially, yep. what we're saying. Yeah. Um, let me show you a few more details about uh, how no superluminal signaling is proven in, in quantum theory. Um, so, so now everything I say, everything I've said thus far in, in the talk has not involved quantum mechanics in any way, right? So all I've said is what follows for any realist theory uh, which hopes to explain certain experimental correlations under the assumption that everything's local, that you know, no influences can propagate fast than the speed of light. And, and the conclusion is, well, if for that kind of game, uh, the last game I showed, you can only possibly win that game 75% of the time. That's a consequence. That's something that's true of any local realist model. Um, and so, so now you can look at quantum mechanics and ask, does it admit of a hidden variable model as local? Uh, and the fact that it can do better than 75% tells us, no, it, it does not admit of, of such a model. Uh, but even if quantum mechanics were discovered tomorrow to be false, because of the experiments we did, so modulo closing those loopholes, uh, because of experiments, we know that we live in a world where those correlations are greater than 75%. So whatever theory is going to describe that world, it can't have a local uh, model underlying it. So, this, so Bell's theorem is, is not just a statement about quantum theory, it's a statement about any successor to quantum theory. Uh, we just can't have uh, locality. Uh, given the sorts of correlations we're seeing in the lab. Uh, okay, so, so now I want to tell you a bit about you know, why I, I, I just sort of claim that quantum mechanics can, can do this with probability 85%. And now I'm going to tell you why that is. Um, so remember, the, let me just sort of introduce some formalism. So I, I hope thus far that things are just so you know, intuitive and I've tried to stay away from the formalism. But let's put some formalism in now. So the probability of winning that game, success, was just the probability of winning the game under each of the four possible uh, measurement conditions. And each of those four conditions occurred with probability of quarter. And uh, the theories that are what's called locally causal, the, the ones that uh, cannot send signals, uh, cannot send influences, have no superluminal influences, so they can only use these local instruction sets. Well, we showed that their probability of success has to be greater than equal to 75%. This uh, is the sort of thing that's called the Bell inequality. It's, it's an inequality on experimental statistics. So this thing is entirely expressed in terms of the statistics of many different uh, measurements, uh, many different experiments. Uh, and it's just, it, it tells you an upper bound on some combination of experimental statistics, which holds for all local theories. That's what a Bell inequality is. So we've already uh, derived one today. Um, and Quantum theory predicts that you can achieve 85%. And here's how you do it. So the initial preparation scheme is of two qubits. 
that are just prepared in this maxillary entangled state, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And then over here on the left, for the uh, S and the T measurements, we choose uh, um, these two bases in a plane of the block sphere. If they were spins, it would be Z and X spin, but you know, we should probably imagine that they're photons. So they're things like uh, uh, you know, a horizontal polarization and maybe a diagonal polarization or something like that. And then over on the right, uh, we, we choose S and T to be slightly different bases. Uh, so they're going to be the ones that are at 45 degrees relative to those guys in the block sphere. OK, so uh, these are the kinds of correlations that we're trying to generate to, to win the game. And so I need to convince you that uh, this game is won with this probability. Uh, so here's how it works. Suppose that um, this uh, measurement over here is done for the direction n hat, which in this case could be either you know, z or x. Uh, then what, what's the state um, that you collapse to on the other end? Well, it's just the inner product of this uh, up along n and psi. And so if up along n is uh, just expressed as you know, cos theta over 2, 0, plus sine theta over 2, 1, you, know, it's, you don't only need the real amplitudes because it's in a plane of the block sphere. Um, so you know, n determines theta. So if it's that state, then I just take the overlap with this guy, and I basically collapse the distance system to the same cos theta over 2, sine theta over 2. So it's collapsed to the plus n basis. So that's not surprising. Uh, basically, that this guy just generates perfect correlation for any axis uh, in the block sphere. And so now, if this guy is being measured along the m hat axis, different from the n hat axis, the probability of getting the up outcome is just uh, the uh, so the probability of getting up along m here and up along n over there is just this mod squared. Uh, but because n acting on psi collapses me to plus n on b, that's just this expression. Uh, and if I uh, conventionally choose n to be, say, the z-axis, so that n is defined relative to this guy, so theta now describes the angle between them, uh, then this is just cos squared theta over 2. So I mean, this is something that you could work out easily in using the block sphere uh, formalism if you want to. Uh, theta is the angle on the block sphere, I should say. And, and so in this particular case, let's say I'm doing, I don't know, uh, s over here and s over here. And the green outcome is the up outcome. Well, the angle between them is just uh, uh, 45 degrees on the block sphere. So it's uh, theta over 2 is pi by 8. And cos squared theta, cos squared pi by 8 is just this 1 half plus 1 over 2 over 2. And then if you look at all the other combinations, so you know, if I do S and S, I should get agreement. And they're 45 degrees apart. If I do S and T, uh, you know, so what I'm, what I'm sort of I'm pointing to these things, what I mean is that if I get the green S outcome over there, then I collapse this guy to the green S outcome. And it's the overlap between this state and this state that determines how often that correlation occurs. So again, it's, it's 45 degrees here. If I get, uh, I don't know, the T red outcome, uh, then for S red, you know, that's 45 degrees apart. Uh, for uh, T, on the other hand, so for T and T, uh, I find that the T red outcome over here and the T red outcome from over there, which is down at the bottom of the block sphere, uh, they're not 45 degrees apart. That's the only exception. It's now that the T red outcome from the left and the T green outcome from the right that are 45 degrees apart. And what that means is that with probability 85% for the T and T case, you're going to see anti-correlation. You're going to get the opposite outcomes. So, so the geometry of the block sphere is such that uh, this particular game we've defined gives you exactly the correlations that you want 85% of the time each. So you know, if we measure S and S, we'll get agreement 85% of the time. If we measure T and T, we'll get disagreement 85% of the time. So overall, you win the game 85% of the time. OK, uh, so this is sort of just a standard form calculation. What about the, the no signaling? So there's also a very standard uh, discussion of this. Imagine now that you're doing some arbitrary measurement over here, not necessarily <coughs> the ones we've been talking about. So some POVM here, some POVM over here. And now instead of that maximally entangled state, imagine you have some arbitrary density operator for these two guys. Uh, now I want to prove to you that in this scenario, uh, you cannot send signals, meaning the statistics of measurements over here don't depend on the choice of measurement over there. So uh, if I'm interested in statistics over here, I'm just interested in P of J. That's just the sum over k of p of k and j, the joint probabilities for getting the kth outcome there and the jth outcome here. But this guy here is just given by our old friend the Born rule. 
trace of rho a, b times this product of these p over m elements. And if I sum over k, if I pull that inside the trace, I get, I sum up these guys, they sum to identity. Um, and so this is an expression that depends only on the fj's and not at all on the identities of the ek's. So no matter which p over m I've used over there, when I sum over k, I always get identity. So these probabilities don't depend on all, at all on that trace of p over m. And that's why uh, quantum theory never admits signaling using this kind of uh, measure over here and try to influence the statistics over there. Um, I should say finally that, that you know, as, as long as you, when you represent your measurements, you represent the POVM on that guy to be on a different Hilbert space from the POVM on that guy, then you're, you're basically enforcing uh, the fact that the statistics of one can't influence the statistics of the other. Yes? Mm, why, and why should we expect quantum theory to allow no signaling? At least normal quantum theory, which is not going to work. Well, there's, so there's two ways in which your theory might achieve signaling. One way would be design the Hamiltonian such that you know, changes to the quantum state over here actually have influences on the form of the quantum state over there faster than the speed of light. So that would just be sort of putting it into the Hamiltonian. So, so when we say quantum theory is non-signaling, uh, we typically mean, you know, assuming you've chosen a Hamiltonian that doesn't allow signaling. But, but the other way it might have been non-signaling is sort of a more subtle way where you might have thought, well, it's not about the Hamiltonian. It's about uh, measurement statistics. You know, you might have thought that it was possible because of the weird calculus that quantum theory uses to calculate statistics, that perhaps the choice of what you measured over here could influence the statistics over here faster than the speed of light. And, and what I've just proven to you here is that it, it can't. Uh, so neither of these respects can quantum theory be used to send signals faster than the speed of light. Uh, OK. Um, so, so question, is, is the proof I've just given you, so the proof that quantum theory can uh, violate Bell, a Bell inequality, is that proof robust to imperfections in the state preparation? So the, the proof I gave, this is you know, this proof over here, assumed that the uh, preparation was of this pure quantum state over the two qubits. Uh, what if it had uh, some noise in it? You know, what if it wasn't this pure quantum state? Uh, would the proof still go through? What do you think? If it's a mixture of those maximally entangled states, then it would be fine. But the more you get towards the product states, the worse it would become sort of violation. That's certainly true. That um, if if you add enough noise to an entangled state, at some point you can get a state that factorizes into a mixed state on the left and a mixed state on the right, and that kind of state can't generate any correlation. So clearly, if you add enough noise, you're not going to be able to violate the Bell inequality. Um, but if, if you actually add just a little bit of noise, right? So if I think about, this, it's not a block sphere now, but I think of the, the convex set of all states on two qubits. There's sort of an extremal point, which is this maximally entangled state. And then I sort of move into the space, and it gets more and more mixed. But if I'm epsilon away from that pure entangled state, then the statistics I generate are uh, you know, some function of epsilon away from the ones I've described. And the ones I described were at 85%. And there's a long way to go before you hit 75. So actually, I can add uh, a certain amount of noise to that preparation procedure and still have a probability of winning the game that's greater than 75%. Uh, and so I can still violate the Bell inequality, even though that my preparation is not exact. And that's a good thing, because no experiment really ever prepares a pure noise-free uh, quantum state. OK, what about, uh, is, the proof, is the proof robust to imperfections in the measurement? So say we, you know, we'd assumed that we were doing these perfect spin um, or, or qubit observables. But you know, in reality, we can only ever do POVMs that aren't quite uh, extremal. Can we still violate the Bell inequalities with, with those things?
Is it, is it different from the case of preparations? And if so, why? Yeah. Well, I suppose that, um, as we saw, you kind of depends on, say you have some noise, you can describe it as being a part of the state or part of the measurement. So by virtue of the previous answer, you would say that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, if I'm just imagining a kind of a noise process before I get fed into the, the measurement device, then I could always associate that noise process with the measurement or the preparation. And given that I can, you know, move away from the perfect preparation, uh, and I still have room between 85% and 75%, then it shouldn't matter then that my measurements are a bit noisy. And again, uh, if, if, if it weren't the case, then we, there would be no hope of experimentally verifying this because, you know, the experiments never measure truly projective measurements. Okay. Um, actually, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, and uh, next time I'll, I'll say a few more words about non-locality and uh, Bell's definition of locality, and then we're going to move on to proof of contextuality. Okay. See you next time. <coughs>